we have a test case right in front of us with your daughter as the Juilliard success. She walked that path and she showed that homeschoolers can. So uh, how did homeschooling prepare your daughter for her, I guess, musical vocation? I really don't know how she could be where she is right now without homeschooling, honestly. Um, we uh, made time for music, but she basically practiced practiced and practiced for two solid years and um, before that she was taking regular lessons and doing a lot of work but we you know I said if we're if you're going to do this we have to we're going to do it right welcome to homeschool talks a podcast by HSLDA this is a show about all things homeschooling from practical tips to inspiring stories and everything in between This episode of Homeschool Talks features a conversation originally hosted live on our Facebook page. So if you like what you hear, be sure to follow us there for more content like this. We're so glad you've joined us today, and we hope you enjoy the program. Hello. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jeremiah Lorig, and I serve as Deputy Director of HSLDA's Generation Joshua. Joining me today is Allison DeMarco founder of the Sacred Music Florida Competition and a homeschool mom. We will get to know Allison and her story of installing the love of music in her homeschool program, which eventually led to her daughter to attend Juilliard. But first, uh, feel free to put any questions you have for Allison or I in the comments, and we will save time at the end to go over those questions. Thanks again for talking with us today, Allison. Will you share with us a little bit about yourself and your family to get us started? Sure, of course. Um, So uh, I am married to my husband, Romeo DeMarco, (laughs) and uh, we... Um, we've been living here in Boca Raton, Florida for about 30 years now, and we have two children. Um, we have our daughter who is 22 and graduating college, uh, this May. And then our son who's 17 and he's all graduating high school this May. And, um, you know, we've been homeschooling since they were in kindergarten and, you know, we, uh, our, our family here is basically, uh, musicians, but we're also in the boating business, and uh, it's just it's just um, it's a wonderful time. Uh, it you know having both the kids graduate together like this. Great, so uh, entrepreneurs and musicians. What a, what a combination <laughs> there. <laughs> True. Well, that's great. So, could you talk to us a little bit about, I guess, your story in terms of how? you got into music what's your musical mm. background what 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 in well first uh, off i guess what i'm curious before we get to like your 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 resume is what got you into music in the first place what what oh. attracted you to okay. to love the sound of melodies well you know that's interesting because um my mom growing up in a really small town in oklahoma was the organist and um choir director at our small little church there. So I grew up literally being in church almost every day after school because, you know, she was either doing something with the kids or with music or with with the choir there. And um, so I grew up around that. And when it came time to go to college, it really, I didn't really see any other choice. That's just what I loved. And she had taken me, you know, hours from our house to lessons every week and you know, made sure she found um, the best teacher she could find in our area. And uh, it was just, you know, it was just a natural thing. I went to the University of Arkansas and had a uh, degree in um, music education and um, then went to University of New Mexico for a master's. And um, yeah, actually met my husband there because he was singing in an opera company. I'm a flutist, actually, an orchestral flutist. And um he was singing in an opera company that I was playing for. And of course, when you're under the stage, you know, you can't see anyone, you can't see anything that's going on and uh, nobody can see you, but you can't see them. And um, so I thought he had just a tremendous voice and had asked the conductor, you know, could you introduce me to whoever that is up there that's singing? And so that's how we ended up meeting. So we both ended up with a, with a love of music and, um, 
you know, and, and just continuing uh, down that road. Uh, so it was in your DNA from your roots <laughs> in Oklahoma and you right? followed your, your desire to, to chase that, that thing that, that was calling yes. you and it led yes. you to true love. Well, this sounds like a fairy tale. <laughs> it, it led to Romeo. <laughs> Literally, Everybody in this case. Him. <laughs> and he's a junior, too. So, <laughs> But, you know, interestingly enough, and I, I just thought of this, is that in my little hometown there, we had a gentleman who had become a, the harpist, I guess, for the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. He played for... That's right down the street I, from where we are at HSLDA. Oh, wow. That's amazing. What yeah. a beautiful place that is. What an oh, amazing is. hall. I love and it. so many tremendous performances. Yeah. And this gentleman became the, um, he was the harpist for the Air Force uh, band there in Washington, D.C. And he ended up writing a lot of the music for orchestras and transcribing them into band pieces for the Air Force band played for many presidents. So when he would come into our little town, um, my mom would um, would take me over and I would spend the day with him and he would teach me so many things. So, Oh, do you remember any specific uh, lessons or any, any, any ditties oh, or, you know, like, I don't know what, what he would have taught you. What, what kind of things would, would <laughs> oh. somebody teach you in that, in that kind of context? I, I want, I think the main thing that he did was he inspired me. He would tell me about all his travels all over the world. He would tell me about the, the incredible flutist that he got a chance to play with. And then a couple of times that I would get to play with him for things back in our little area. And I thought that was just the most incredible thing, you know, well, I got it's, to play it's with really him. inspiring to <laughs> talk to somebody who plays with world-class people from all around, yes. and then they're, they're playing with you. And, and it, 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 yes. one of the things I love about music is that it's it, it is of all the 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 careers out there. It seems to me, and of course you're the expert, so correct me if I'm wrong. But it, it's more of a meritocracy. It's it is about your skill. Can you actually achieve the objective right. and do it in a beautiful way? That's true. That's true. Because ultimately, it's about you know, can you play? You know, when you're auditioning for something, when you're auditioning for the music school, the college, the orchestra, the whatever, ultimately that's what it's about is is how you fit into the ensemble. You know, are you able to uh, to do what would be required of you? So, yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so, so you, yeah. you, you learned from him and, and so how do you yeah. incorporate your music background? I mean, you, you've got a pretty impressive resume. How do you incorporate that into being a homeschool mom and kind of mm. passing the torch of at, at least a, an intro or I don't know, like, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that your, your children are going to be the, uh, following you necessarily because you oh. know, each person has their own <laughs> path, but, uh, you, you can incorporate that, that passion into your homeschool program. And how have you done that? Oh, yeah. Well, I think one of the, you know, music, a lot like sports, uh, you know, people can make the comparison all the time. I think that uh, music and sports, things of that nature, they are, um, they, they cause you in order to be good, you have to have a, a self discipline, you have to have an ability to be able to break down complex, um, complex thoughts or complex music or whatever into doable segments, you have to be able, it, it works the side, it works both sides of your brain, you know, and it helps you and gives you uh, that um, perseverance that you need. Like if something gets hard, you don't give up, you keep going. And if you, it doesn't work this way, you try another way, but you keep going. And that applies to any area of, your, of life. It doesn't matter what someone in music does. Um, you have the tools to be successful when you are, have studied music at, at a, at a, you know, a, even a medium level, you know, you have those tools because, you know, so many things in our lives uh, are difficult and you need to be able to figure out and have those skills to be able to go at it maybe a different way if yeah. you don't succeed the first time. That's so. great. So question for you, <laughs> sure. there are, Many parents will have it, have this idea, oh, I should teach, I should have my kids learn something about music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they know it instinctually. It's kind of culturally something we're aware of. But sure. you as somebody who's on the front lines teaching young people about music, what is the benefit of studying mm -hmm. music? 
Why is that a thing that people mm -hmm. should should seriously consider for their kids and for themselves? Mm. Well, you know, I think one of the a, a benefit that just that came to my mind right as you're saying that is the fact that you know, like I was saying, music works both sides of your brain. And a lot of the times when you're in school, you're so working, and I hope I get this right, that I believe the left side of your brain, controlled by the right side, the more logical, you know, and of course, we do use that side of our brain often in um, music. However, I think a lot of the time in school, we miss out on the other side of the brain, do you know? And, and if you're, you know, it's important, you know, there's, there's art and music and different things that are creative. And I think that, and I always advise, you know, parents to, you know, start your kids on piano because it's a visual, you know, me as a flutist, I never see my fingers. I don't see anything. I don't have a visual for that. Um, a lot of instruments, you don't have a visual as such. So you start out on piano because you've got that here and it's, kind of the logical side of things. But then when you learn, just like learning to read, you know, it's difficult at first and you sound out the letters and you and you learn to put the letters together. Learning to read music is very similar. And you do hit that point where you're sounding out words and it's very frustrating because you can't just read the book, you know. But in music, the same way, if you get over that hump, a lot of people quit at that hump, but you keep going and you eventually get to the point where you can read. And when you do, the advantage, I think, just blossoms of music because you have a way that you can express yourself. If you're happy, if you're sad, if you're frustrated, if you're really joyful, whatever it is, you can literally just sit down and play out your emotions sometimes. And it's wonderful. And I think it's good for kids to have that. And it's really good for them to be able to kind of balance out um you know, because that creative side will pour into other things that they're doing, you know, and it needs to be nurtured, I believe. So that's great. And I, as uh, you know, you're, you're the expert on music, so I'm going to totally <laughs> defer to you, but I love <laughs> philosophy. And so I philosophize Ooh. about these kind of things. And one of the things that I've, uh, put some thought into is it seems to me that music is the language of emotion. It is the way that we can express emotions that we can't express with words. It, mm. it, it enables us to to not articulate in in the in the sense of using words, but rather a a way to fully present something that can make the world a more beautiful place because it it, yeah. it expresses the complexity of what emotion has that we can't fit into maybe the words that we can form on a page. Do you know, that is, that is such a great point because I believe that I, you know, I talk with my daughter often, you know, in these last four years and I've learned so much from what she's learning there. But, um, you know, one of the things that we talk about is, is that a piece of music is like, like a painting almost. It's like a work of art, except, you know, instead of brushes and colors and things of that nature, you are literally taking this. And, and when people listen to music, when you, especially when you listen to this really amazing, fine music, which is important, by the way, that you listen to good music, but you, um, you know, you can develop like a, a like a, 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 almost like a portrait or a painting in your mind. When you're learning a piece, you know, you are focusing on what emotion that you want to portray. What is it that you want the audience to hear? What is it that you are trying to get across? And how are you going to do that? What tools do you have as a musician in order, you know, to make a sound painting and to reach the emotions of people through basically through sound and um and it's it's an amazing it's an amazing gift that we have you know to be able to be able to do that there are so many tools yes yeah well and you're you're passing you're you're passing this love for music down to your children as a homeschool mom how can other homeschool moms and dads mm. how can they mm do this maybe maybe they they have musical experience maybe they don't and maybe how can they join alongside with their students in mm. this new enterprise that's stepping into okay. the, a, a a open sea that is full <laughs> of beauty and and music there's okay that's a really good question and a topic that i've been i've been 
delving into lately that I, I love because just because you're not a musician or not um, you're not familiar with music doesn't mean that you cannot help your child along with their musical studies. For instance, if you go, and I, I always like to use this example because at a school that we have nearby here, they uh, maybe, for instance, their swimming meets two hours every day after school. And, you know, as a, that's what, 10 hours a week that they are with their swimming coach and then they meet all summer long. So, um, you know, a lot of the sports teams, they're meeting regularly, but we as musicians, we go for maybe an hour lesson a week and we expect magic, you know? And um, the thing is, is, the majority of the work is taking place at home. So as parents, it's very important to know how to guide your kids through this. And I like a couple of things. You know, one thing I really like is being able to listen to very good music, very good music. And, you know, some of the, you know, going on, anything coming from Lincoln Center, from the London Symphony, listening to some of the great works of the Romantic era in Debussy and Saint-Saëns, some of these beautiful pieces that they might not be familiar with. But getting in their ear what's, what good sounds like is very important. But then also, um, I like, for instance, you see the Learning Pyramid online. And you see at the bottom of the pyramid where the most retention takes place is when they teach it to someone else. So my thought is I like for the kids to be able to teach their parents what they're learning. And the parents really need to jump in and ask questions. You know, what is this on the page? What does that mean? What is this? What is that? And then as you do that, you're going to become more adept at learning. Can you give some examples of some questions that parents oh. should ask? Oh, of course. Okay, so maybe what does this symbol mean? What uh, does are you, you know, if you hear something that's, uh, you know, asking questions instead of saying to them, well, I think you're supposed to be doing this or you're supposed to be doing that, but let them tell you and figure it out. Because I will tell you this. I, my daughter took Irish step dance for 10 years. I know nothing about Irish step dance. <laughs> and I thought she's got to be successful. So I told her, you know, you, you know, teach me to dance, teach me these dance. And so she taught me how to do it. And she taught me the technique. And the next thing you know, we're entering a parent child Irish dance competition division. And so, which was, I don't even want to talk about it. It was scary and it's over. <laughs> But we did it. I will never Brave forget soul. it. We will never forget that moment. <laughs> but in the same way, let your child teach you. Teach you. Let them, you know, ask about all the things on the page, even if you know what it is. Ask so them. So what is this? What is, what this? is that? How, exactly. And how are we how do you understand what you're seeing? Questions like yes. that? Yes. Exactly. And and let them help you and practice and work on it and get better and let them you know, who knows? You could really learn to play and your child could, it could help you along the way. But I think it's very important that, you know, one of the experiments I did with my daughter growing up was that every time she sat, was sitting at the piano, basically, I thought, what would it be like to have a lesson every day? And the lesson wasn't me sitting there with her and going, okay, do this, do that. The lesson was me just being in the kitchen and saying, oh, what was that? What was that that just happened? Oh, could you try it like this? What if you did that? What if you did this? And um, so, yeah. so do you think it's healthy to say things like speed it up a little bit, slow it down a little bit? I want to hear what that that could be like, or is that, so. is that interfering yeah. with the uh, the, the, the learning process? It? You know, what if you changed it? Everything, you know, music like art can be very subjective. What would that sound like if it was faster? What would that sound like if it was slower? What would it be like if you thought of this entire piece as one big phrase rather than a whole bunch of little ones? Do you know? What would that change in your mind or in your thinking? And when they do something right, ask them, what did you just do? That was beautiful. What'd you change? Hmm. It, you know, and then go back, play it the way you did before. And what, what are some, you, you just mentioned something that, that sparked in my mind. What are some compliments that would be helpful to give your children Ooh. if they are, if they're learning something? So I, I have, uh, mm. uh, you know, I, I, I think of the little kids who I know and love who play the violin and oh, when yes. they're starting out, it's a little rough, right? It, it, rough. Takes, it takes, it takes a little bit for them to get it right. Yes. But what can, <laughs> what can we compliment them to, to help them uh, flourish and find their, their love and joy in music? 
Well, you know what? I think it's really important when you do hear something good to point it out immediately and tell them that was wonderful. Tell me how you did it. You know, the other thing is, is that you um, you can talk to them about how you really are proud of them for working hard today. And I know it wasn't easy. I know this was a difficult passage and maybe you don't know it yet, but you know what? You're a lot further today than you were yesterday. And every day you're making progress. And I'm so proud of you for not giving up, you know? And it is I a discipline. Like, it is. It's a discipline. And you know what? Here's the kicker. You will never be good enough <laughs> for yourself. Do you know what I mean? The better you get, the more and the higher the level you get, the more you realize how much more you need to learn. And um, so it, you're never going to arrive and say, you know what, I'm an unbelievable flutist now. That's just not going to happen because there's always learning. And once you come to that realization that it's just a constant growing throughout your entire career, basically. So uh, how did homeschooling prepare your daughter for her, um, I guess, musical vocation? Well, I, I really don't know how she could be where she is right now without homeschooling, honestly. Um, we uh, made time for music. We cut out a lot of other things <laughs> to make time for music. But, you know, by we started early. We're not fast, but she basically had completed all the high school that we were going to do. And by 16, we, we just started early and, and that was it. But we started the dual enrollment program online. And, um, at 16, we knew that in two years she was going to need to go to a college. So in that two years, she would take one class online at a time. And if it music was in, if it was interfering with the music, we would kind of hold off on it for a little while. But she basically practiced, practiced, and practiced for two solid years. And um, before that, she was taking regular lessons and doing a lot of work. But we, you know, I said, if we're if you're going to do this, we have to we're going to do it right, and we have to work hard because when you go to these auditions. Um, no one's going to give you a, a test and tell, ask you what you know about music. They're going to listen to you and they're going to say, you know, yes or no, basically, whether you're in. And um, so I found a teacher in um, about three hours north of us. And we drove for three years in a row every Monday. We drove over about three hours and 20 minutes north of Orlando from Boca Raton. And we would uh, come back in the same day. And because I found a good teacher, basically found a very good teacher and You're able um, to prioritize that. And one of the things mm -hmm. I, uh, yes, I think of my family, my, my, I, I'm not very musically savvy. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. And I, I love going to the Kennedy center, for example, to hear beautiful music, wow. but, wow. uh, growing up, I had a, a, a family with seven siblings, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, me and six others. And one of the things that homeschooling allowed us to do was have flexibility in our schedule so that my sister, mm -hmm. who wanted to be a professional ballet dancer, uh, could mm -hmm. chase after that, that goal and vision. And my brother, who he, he didn't want to go professional with it per se, but he was really mm -hmm. into basketball. And each and, and those are just two examples. Of course, each each person in the family kind of had their own passion and desire and interests. And my mom was able to find ways to open the doors of opportunity there because we mm -hmm. were homeschooled. And so we could we could build our schedule in such a way that actually worked for the various students or kids, us each of us, to uh, mm -hmm to chase after something that we were passionate about. And of course, me being mm. the, the the bookish uh, one, I, I, I would want to go to the library. My sister, mm. and bro, you know, my brother would be uh, being a basketball player and my sister would be a ballet dancer. And I'm like, can I go to the library? I want to get another book. <laughs> <laughs> but the flexibility was there for each each child to, to chase after what they were passionate about. It's true. And, you know, with that's it, the flexibility, you said the word, it's flexibility. And you can spend the time doing what your kids are good at. And, you know, my son is going to flight school in July after he graduates. He um, and he can he's been able to prep for that and do what they want him to do to prep for that because of homeschooling. And and through this flexibility, he's been able to try different things and look at different uh, aspects of life and see where he fits in. And without that, you know, um, 
I, I don't know that he would have realized that this is where he's supposed to be. And same with my daughter. Um, I, I really don't know how we could have done it without the flexibility um, of homeschooling. Well, and, and your daughter, to, no spoilers, but well, I guess it is a spoiler. <laughs> she's at Juilliard and, and that's that, that path to Juilliard. Uh, I want to hear that story, but could you start mm. at the very beginning? How did you st like get her started in the first place? You mentioned piano as, mm -hmm. as kind of the first step was, was mm -hmm. what you wanted to do was give her something or, or what did, is that what you did with her? Yes. It was piano. So you wanted something that was visual as well as musical and you wanted to, mm -hmm. to step her in. So like uh, we have we have listeners who have, you know, seven. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the listeners posted, she says, I have a seven month old and I want to be starting. But how oh. do I even start? You know, that, right. that, that's that's the level where we, I, I want to start with. And then we'll see early. this path. That. Yeah. How, how would you start? And, you know, maybe someday some of these people will go to Juilliard. Well, I'll tell you, and let's start from the very beginning with the with a child that's seven months old and will be and will be coming along and walking very soon. And you know, when they're that age, I love to stick with just um, enjoying and dancing with them and using little rhythm instruments and things like that. But when they are, um, and this ties into you know how uh, my daughter got started, is that they. I came to the realization that the fine motor skills needed to play piano, for instance, they aren't there for a long time. And what happens is you can get the little books that say little Mozart and all these little things. And, and they're, they're great, you know, but in the Suzuki program is amazing. But sometimes with piano, the problems that you have is that they move incredibly slow. They have to because the kids don't have the motor skills to do what they're really needing to do. And that ends up frustrating the children and they lose interest very early in life. So my advice would be just stick with the, with the dancing and the listening and enjoying things and playing the little instruments and maybe going to a Suzuki class, which is great because the motor skills are different for that. Uh, you know, but you know, I would, I, my daughter didn't start till she was nine. Um, we, Knowing that our family was involved in music, especially at our church, uh, I know a lot of people were saying, oh, when are you going to start? When are you going to do this? And you're going to do that. But I really waited for her to ask. You know, I said, when you're ready and you really want to learn to play, um, then, you know, ask and, and we'll learn. But what I did teach her to do prior to that was I, I taught her a song. I think it was... Um, so this is love or something, a Disney princess song, because, you know, we went quite a few times, you know, when they were little. And so I taught her to play it by rote. And the goal was you teaching her to love to play. And everybody, oh, look, she can play this little song and her feet wouldn't even reach the pedals, you know. But it made her really enjoy it and realize what she could do. So then when we turn around and we say, okay, you really want to learn to play now. So we have to go back and we have to learn the notes and we have to learn the rhythms. That part of it was really that fun because, <laughs> because she thought, okay, I already know how to play. What are we going to do now? You know, so, <laughs> but yeah, so going back, but if you want to go a little further down the road with how she ended up, um, this is something that I think is really important to kind of stick in the back of your mind, especially if your kids are in piano, is that, you know, I taught her piano until, I mean, maybe around 11, 12 years old. Then I, our, our church is very big with pipe organ and everything. And so I had our organist uh, start to teach her lessons on organ. And what I realized, she, she got a job. 13 at a retirement community here in Boca and where she played until she graduated, which was wonderful every week. And, and that's combining mm -hmm. a job with service. Cause that's, yes. that's, that's something yes. where the, the it's yes. not the standard audience, right? It's, it's not, it's right. not, uh, you know, a concert hall, but it's people who will really appreciate it and you can hone your skill. You can hone your skill and the, all the, the residents were so kind to her and so encouraging over the years. And you know what? There's a little secret in the, in the kind of the music world and I'll let it out just for, just for here today. But I'll tell you when you're going into college, if you're playing piano, if you're in high school, junior high, whatever, go take organ lessons with someone because 
pianists will, I'll tell you, by at Juilliard, they're going to audition by thousands, you know, hundreds or, or you know, hundreds of people, maybe a thousand people auditioning for the piano division. You go into the pipe organ division, maybe you're talking 100, 200. You are in a much better place. And when you get out, the jobs are, are plentiful in that department. You know, they are, um, they're, they're plentiful. Pianists are going to have a lot more difficult time finding work, you know, but uh, yeah. What I, what I love about this, this story yeah. is you start by, you're strategic all the way through. You start by <laughs> playing music for her and she mm. hears the music and learns to love the music. Then you make it into a game with, with, with uh, uh, I, I forget what the things you said, but like bells and stuff oh, yeah. and kind of dancing around, right? And, yeah. <laughs> and, and you're strategic each step of the way. And then you get to the point where you want her to ask what mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to play. To play. Right. So I, 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 I appreciate that you're strategic about it the whole, the whole way through, but you're also adjusting your strategy for mm. uh, the ability and the context and the, the, the you know, the person uh, that's right mm. in front of you. In this case, your daughter, you, you mm -hmm. see her for who she is and you, you adjust the, the strategy to fit her. So now she ends up in Juilliard. What, what, tell us a little bit about that story. It sounds like you were strategic. Oh. You, you, you get, okay. you open some doors for her, but you know, <laughs> Juilliard, that's like, you know, world class. What yeah. happened there? Oh my goodness. So we, we, so her teacher that we were going to driving all the way, who's amazing musician. Um, he, I asked him one day because, you know, she was maybe uh, starting her senior year. We were pretty late. If anyone's listening, I would do this prior to when we did it, but you know, she was a senior and um, it was in the fall. And I said, what are the best organ teachers in the country? Where are they? Where do they teach? So he gave me the name of like four different colleges. So I went on to the website and found out, because all of them tell you for auditions, we require a Bach trio sonata, we work from the romantic period, I work from here, and work from there. And so I wrote it all down and I took it to him. And he helped to put a program together that incorporated all the requirements for all four colleges. And then we sent out applications and thankfully she ended up with an audition at each one of the locations. We flew to each one. And when you were there, which is another thing, it's really great if your child does this, you can get a lesson with the teacher while you're there. Like after your audition, you can take a lesson with them, do it. It was, it helped us in so many different ways to decide different things. Um, then we, um, my daughter said to me, um, when I told her I'd applied at Juilliard um, as well, she, I, cause she didn't want to know, you know, she was a little anxious about it. She says, don't tell me, just let me practice and, and take me where I need to go. <laughs> and so I did tell her about that. And she says, oh, she goes, oh, mommy, I don't know that I can take that level of rejection in my life. <laughs> And I said, don't worry, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go there. We're going to have a wonderful time. We're going to go to New York and we're going to go to the school. You're going to play and then we're going to go out and then we'll, you know, and, and we'll enjoy a few things around the area. And so, um, so I, you know, so just relax because it's, you know, we'll go there and we'll, and, and we'll just enjoy our time. So anyway, um, throughout all these different auditions, uh, when we went there, I, um, I knew when I met her teacher, her current teacher, I knew that this was the right place for her. And this was prior to her audition. And, you know, I just, you know, like I did for all the auditions, you know, just sat outside the door and prayed, you know. And interestingly enough, um, uh, there, when they talked to her afterwards, the her answer to some of the questions that they asked her happened to fall right in line with what the school is all about. They're really about creating and playing outside the box, you know? Um, and that was sort of matched, well, matched right up with the, a lot of the answers that she had given to him when he asked her what, what her goals were. And so, you know, we heard from them um, fairly quickly and, uh, and, and, but, you know, we didn't, and I'll, I'll, so this could be controversial, but we did not do, I'll tell you what we didn't do. We did not do a lot of theory we didn't do any ear training. We didn't study music history. We didn't do anything because at the time when I realized she's got talent and we need to, they just need to be able to play really well, you know? And so when they go to these auditions, that has to be 
where they're rock solid. And, um, you know, the other things can come. She's really good at theory in her training now, but she got it there. So, wow. um, yeah. Well, that's that, that's <laughs> a, a rip roaring adventure. So we, we, we've <laughs> talked about kind of the beginning with like a, with a toddler and and mm. kind of the like the, so it's kind of the lowest levels of introducing kids to music and the highest levels of, of getting into Juilliard. What about uh, parents who are are feeling like, oh, no, you know, my kids, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old. Mm. And I, have I dropped the ball? What can they do to catch up? Oh, like they've, they've got kids in that range. Because you, you, you started the, uh, the music uh, competition, right? So how, how do people step into that? Oh, into the uh, into the role of what do they do at this? Is this age level? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, take get them performing for anything and everything perform for competitions your recitals your family whatever but perform regularly and see you know just get used to this but you are you are very much not late <laughs> because like i said i didn't even start teaching my daughter until she was like nine years old and um so you have plenty of time and as a matter of fact when they're older like that they learn much more rapidly than they do when they're young so to me i find it um you know i find it encouraging because music when you hit a plateau when you're not when you're not making progress it's not fun you know it's like somebody's sitting there trying to do algebra problems and saying you know and you're telling them oh you 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 need to have fun this is supposed to be fun well it's not you know but when it's hard it's not fun and and so learning to find the ways around the hard and around the problems is very important and um you know you mentioned the competition that's one of the things I'm, I'm speaking about there is basically creative practice techniques and how to take those those plateaus or those obstacles that are standing in front of you especially at that young age because you're developing habits you're developing habits that will either take you to be for you know to more uh, to greater things or you're going to become discouraged and that even becomes a habit and then you're going to want to give up so um so yeah. what, what do you have for what do you have for uh, parents who mm -hmm. they 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 know that their kids should should uh develop an appreciation for music and and in, learn to enjoy music as a hobby but they're not going to they're not going to uh, chase it all the way to to college well, uh, what 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 would you say to parents mm. in that zone that okay. are are one to to make music a major a, a part of their students lives but not not the career oh of course you know i think that and this goes back to what we were saying that things are fun and enjoyable when you're good at it. And I think that they need to get to the point before they graduate, keep them in it, you know, throughout high school, but they, they need to learn. And that, um, that, uh, you know, perseverance that they learn and being able to overcome these obstacles, knowing that that applies to other things in life that they're going to do, but they need to get to the point where they are able to sit down and just play because otherwise they're not going to enjoy it. It's just going to be hard. But, you know, that would be my goal for those kids who, um, you know, who want, who don't want to do that or like my son who wants to go to flight school. Well, you know what you, you know, get to the point where it's enjoyable and you can just sit down and maybe you have a few books or a few, there's always so many books of music for whatever level you are. But get to the point where you don't feel like a, a beginner. Maybe you're not playing Chopin, but you are enjoying yourself. Maybe you're playing some worship songs that you sing at church. But it, as long as it's enjoyable and getting to that point, it's great. And getting there requires perseverance in, in learning how to get past these things. So whether or not you're going, um, going to college for this or not, it's important to learn that you just don't give up. You look for a way around those problems. So, so as a homeschool mom, you started a mm. homeschool competition, music competition mm. in Florida. Could you tell us a little bit about what what mm. inspired you to start that competition and what makes that that competition uh, something that you continue to invest yourself in? Ah, okay. So yes, uh, it's called Sacred Music Florida, and it's a solo and ensemble competition. We started it for the homeschool community uh, because 
you know, at the time, I think this was eight years ago, there they were not allowed to enter the state solo and ensemble competition that most people go to. And so we provided an alternative for that. But what we realized very quickly is that we're also very different in that, you know, parents can just sign up and enter their own children, which most of these things you have to go through your school band director, or you have to go through a music teacher at school or something of that nature. This one is very accessible to homeschoolers. And we are, um, you know, we look at the whole picture when they're auditioning. I really search out for the judges, the best ones I can find that we're not, as I say, musical accountants. You know, there are some out there in some competitions that, oh, that was a mistake. Oh, this is wrong. That's wrong. Oh, okay. And they have a little thing with their points and they say, okay, well, you made this many mistakes. We look at the overall picture because the beauty and the the beauty of music often, there may be wrong notes, but it might be a gorgeous gorgeous presentation, a, a you know, beautiful work of art that they've created, and, but they made a few mistakes. Okay, we're not interested in your little mistakes. This was a gorgeous uh, performance, you know? So we're You've looking- made the world a more beautiful place. Thank exactly, you. <laughs> exactly. And that's what we're really looking at is what, you know, we're looking at the overall thing and we're there to not to just, you know, to help them to understand what can you do better, but also to look at them and say, you know, the, encourage them, encourage them with really good advice from the, you know, we have two Juilliard judges this year. We've got a couple of other people from, you know, we've used people from Rollins College and everything else in the past. We are, we really seek out people that are encouraging to young people and that will give them advice that they can take home and use right now. We have a class there this this year, The Art of um, Possibility, where he teaches them right on the spot different things that they can do right now that are going to make a dramatic difference in their playing. And so, um, you know, that's one of our goals. And it got started because of a need of this. And also because sometimes as homeschoolers, I, I adjudicated a competition for many years in Palm Beach County. And one of the uh, things that we would know is if it was a Christian school or homeschoolers that would come in and compete. Um, and I, I, they, were, they were always the bottom, always the bottom. And I thought this shouldn't be, do you know? If we're going to this Christian school or we're homeschooled, we've got time. You know, well, the Christian school not as much, but homeschooling, you've got time. So what is it? Why is it they're not that they're not exceeding or rising above their public school counterparts? And so one of the reasons we're doing this, too, is to teach these kids how to excel. Teach the parents. Here's how you work with your kids. Here's you need to go find this person. You need to find a person like this or that to help your children and really pointing them in the right direction so that they can rise above and succeed. Um, this is really tailored towards we, we take kids from any type of school, but we're tailored for homeschools. Uh, wow. homeschool and what, one of the things that I, uh, you know, we hear from time to time is the you're you're ruining your child's opportunities by homeschooling because they don't have a band director and you know things like that and it sounds like what uh there's there's two things that i'm taking away from this conversation one is that homeschooling has the flexibility to allow students to chase after those dreams with with in, in focus and, and intensity and yes. seriousness but number two there are resources out there like like your competition mm. that help equip them to yes. succeed succeed even in a system that that's not designed for them and that uh, and we have we have a test case right in front of us with your daughter as the Juilliard (laughs) success who you know uh, she walked that path and she showed that homeschoolers can right exactly and you know and just as an interjection here um, a large amount of the American students at Juilliard are homeschooled they have time. And, uh, you know, and my daughter is one of the uh, judges for the piano division uh, this year. She's going back for her master's degree there again in the fall, but she's going to be there as as a colleague of hers in the vocal division. And this, you said it just right. This is providing the resources for these families. And we work really hard to to design a day and not just this day where we have workshops. We have a, a a choir this year that's going to be learning from, you know, the, uh, you know, the gentleman who does the uh, candlelight processional at Epcot. He's been a 45 year veteran of teaching in colleges. Amazing man. And 
we have so many people lined up to really help these kids to take what they're doing, no matter what you're doing in the rest of your life, to take them to a new level, to where they can enjoy, to where they can learn, and to where they can really develop skills that will, again, help them in any area of their life. And so, you know, this is a day workshops, choir, competition. However, we're working to make this year round so that all year round, we're going through a book, we're going through this, we're going through uh, the practicing mind, we're going through this book, that book. And there's so many resources. And I just want to be able to take families through this and help them to learn what I'm learning, because there's a world out there that's of information that's not normally accessible. Um, You know, so... Great. So anyway. Wow. So th- there's there's just so many facets to to your story and and your daughter's success that I find intriguing. So th- mm-hmm. there are homeschool families out there that uh, are invested. They 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 know that uh, th- this type of career is something that they want their their students to be to have open to them. And there's mm-hmm. others that really want to open the doors of opportunity, but they don't feel like they have the resources to invest in mm. regular lessons. Do you mm. have any advice for uh, those pe- those parents who are are wanting to see some doors open here, but they, they, mm-hmm. they, they're looking for maybe some low cost ways to step into the uh, oh, into course. the fray, especially if they have like a lot of kids like my family with <laughs> you know seven children uh, lessons could could stack up pretty quick. <laughs> I completely understand. You know, there's there's one year we have every year we have an outstanding soloist of the day from every judge. One one time, one of our winners was studying with someone I think in Slovakia or something online. And you know, there's different options. There are a lot of people studying with people online these days. But you know, on that note too, one of the things that we're going to be doing through the summer is offering a class at no cost that they can learn theory and ear training and music history and things of that nature. You know, so that we can help develop and and make these kids into a really well-rounded musician over time. But there are there are a few options. You can, you know, you can try the online option. Like I said, some of these kids are amazing that are studying online. I mean, some of my daughter's colleagues are teaching online. And, um, you know, so if you're in a certain area in Florida or whatever, or you're looking for someone, I mean, I, you could you know, send an email and we can figure out an option because I think there are always options for people, you know, no matter what, there's always somewhere you can reach out or someone you can reach out to that can help you. Um, Try your church music program. It's wonderful because, you know, all throughout history, you know, you have uh, so many don't do this now, but children's choir, youth choir, all these things, it's all free. And you learn a lot. And then you maybe you, you get uh, in connection with the director at that church. And he says, oh, well, I have somebody who's teaching right now. And, and they're, you know, maybe it's a younger person who's looking to, um, you know, to earn a little bit of money teaching piano. Mm-hmm. Go to them and learn, <laughs> you know, support a homeschooler who's, who's, uh, who's teaching lessons <laughs> at their church. There you go. There you go. My, my, my sisters did ballet. And one of the ways oh, that they... Yeah were able to do the uh, kind of chase that ballet dream. And, and one of them ended up uh, dancing professionally. Uh, but one of the ways they did that was by finding ways to then turn that into making money. So they, they began to teach younger students uh, ballet, for example. And and what, you know, they would have been making money, except that money went straight back into getting themselves lessons. Is there is there is there a similarity in the music world where you as an yes. older student can teach younger students and kind of continue that that process right. in a music school of some sort? Well, here's a here's a thought. T- pay for lessons for your oldest child and then let them teach the younger ones. You know, and then, um, you know, (laughs) let them pass it down because and if you have each child passing it down and this one teaching that one and this one teaching that one, then the next thing you know, according to the, you know, as as, and I really love this, but the learning pyramid, teaching it to someone else is going to only help yourself uh, in the end to learn it more clearly. So once again, homeschooling, (laughs) it's so flexible. It it gives you a lot of options that you can, you know, you're, you're, we are limited by our own creativity, but we're only limited by our creativity. It seems. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. That's That's amazing. So uh, as, as we're coming to, to the end here, uh, trying to think of any questions that our audience has, if, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the comments. Uh, 
Yeah. Allison, do you have anything that, that you kind of feel like you, you still mm-hmm. want to talk about? You still want to tell a story? Um, you know, I just think that, you know, this in, in the music, again, when you learn, when you're going through and you're learning so much, one of the things that we didn't talk about really was motivation and um, what goes on through your mind when you're practicing. And I really, I really think that, um, you know, people talk about performance anxiety and that I can totally understand that because I just played in New York with my daughter (laughs) on her recital and I hadn't been nervous in a long time, but I was nervous (laughs) for that. (laughs) And um, so that the idea of being nervous and doing something anyway is a big deal. You know, you're going to be nervous. Sometimes kids get nervous going into their lessons every week, you know, even in college. <laughs> and sometimes people get nervous going into a recital. People, you know, it, and, you know, I think it's important for kids to learn that anxiety, nervous, these type of things it shouldn't stop you. And it shouldn't hold you back and you shouldn't say, oh, okay, I think I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm scared. Because that's that's another roadblock that you need to get past in your life. And music is, and sports would be the same sort of thing. You know, maybe you're nervous because you're running a race with someone and there's a lot of people in the stands and they're watching you. And, you know, the competition, here's one more item that just came into my mind is that when we compete, and here, we give them a rating, one, two, three, depending on how well they play, just them. But we also rank them. We have six levels, and in each level, we have five age groups. So you're competing against people, for instance, between the ages of 9 and 11 who have studied two years. So you're, you're narrowing it down. But someone's going to be, I think in one level, we've got 12, 15 people. Someone's going to be last, and someone's going to be first. And I tell everybody every year, you know what? This is not about the trophy. This is not about the trophy. This is about the fact that you set a goal. You worked really hard. You came to compete and you're going to walk away a better musician because of it. So I don't want them to get hung up on. I got 12th place or I got fourth place and I really wanted first or whatever. It's a way to learn that sometimes, you know, one person gets first in every division. And I think it's important that we learn that we're not always the first one, but it's okay. Because we just tr- we work harder and we figure out what did I need to do in order to become a better player the next time around. I, I don't know. I think it's an important lesson to learn that um, that sometimes we fail. You know, it's not a failure because you came and you did it and you and you improved. You know, so <laughs> it's amazing how music can touch so many different parts of our lives. Mm. Thank you, thank you for sharing uh, all, all your your story, your wisdom, your your enthusiasm for music. I, I I've really enjoyed this this time. Thank you for having me. This has been wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> for sure. Well, thank you, thank you for joining us today, Allison. Uh, for all our all of our listeners, you can learn more about the Sacred Music Competition. Our, the link will be in the the comments. Parents, if you want uh, to, to learn more about how your child can shine and pursue their passion, HSLDA is here for you. HSLDA believes in making homeschool poss- homeschooling possible, and HSLDA holds annual contests in poetry, in video, in photo, in short story, art, and essay contests, and maybe someday music. Uh, <laughs> you can learn more about these contests at hslda.org slash contests. Also, if you're not a member of HSLDA, we'd love to have you join us at HSLDA hslda.org slash join. Thank you again for joining us, Allison. We loved hearing your stories. I hope you have a great day. Today's episode is made possible by HSLDA's Generation Joshua program. Do you have a student who wants to make a difference in our nation? Generation Joshua empowers teens to make the most of their citizenship through local clubs, immersive simulations, online courses, and real life campaign experiences. For more information, visit generationjoshua.org. That's generationjoshua.org. Thanks for listening to this episode of Homeschool Talks. If you've enjoyed this conversation, will you do us a favor by sharing it with a friend or leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts? 
As a reminder, you can find show notes for this episode, along with our other homeschool talks, conversations at hslda.org forward slash podcast. And if you want to be the first to know about new episodes, as well as upcoming guests and topics, you can sign up for our email list using the link in the show notes. That's all for now. We hope you enjoyed this program and we'll see you next time.